All right, welcome to the Individual Skills Hockey Podcast, a podcast aimed at providing quality education to youth hockey coaches, parents, and players with the mission of having a positive impact on the crazy hockey world. My name is Miles Deeth. I'm one of the boys high school varsity assistants at YZ High School, and I am also the director of hockey operations for YZ Youth Hockey Association. With me today is Ben Monahan. Ben, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, my name is Ben Monahan. I've uh, coached high school hockey for 12 to 15 years, coached youth hockey, uh, scout regionally for USHL and NAL, and I was excited to be part of this podcast until you told me that I'm just a guinea pig and <laughs> this one doesn't really count. But um, I'm looking forward to this. I hope to be a regular guest, and uh, I'm excited to, uh, to talk hockey with you today and in the future. Um, and uh, excited to hear what topic we got to, uh, to discuss today. Yeah, so for everyone listening, this is our first try, and so it's going to be a little rough at the start. Um, but uh, the topic I wanted to talk about with you today was whether or not you can teach hockey sense. And before we start, I think it's important if we kind of define what hockey sense means to us. So you want to take that one? What does hockey sense mean to you? Hockey sense uh, can be a lot of different things, but I look at it as maybe uh, knowing how to play without the puck, knowing what to do with the puck before you get it, knowing uh, certain uh, situations, a power play, penalty kill, or just different systems and knowing how to uh, what to do with the puck before it even comes to you or where to go uh, to those gray areas to get the puck without kind of even being taught things. So it's just things that come natural. Uh, that you don't necessarily, um, you know, that every kid has right away or has been taught, but they can just pick up on things, you know, quicker and, and able to do things with and without the puck uh, more so than maybe other players. Well, I think you alluded to it right there. A lot of people think that, you know, it's one of those things where you either have it or you don't, right? Correct. And I guess my question to you is, is that true, A, and B, if not, you know, we're going to discuss. We've got a lot of things on our sheet here on what can we be doing better to actually teach hockey sense. I mean, I think everybody, I mean, yeah, some kids have it maybe earlier than others. Some kids, you know, are able to pick up on it quicker at a faster pace. But I think it's something you can definitely teach um, kids and players, um, something that they can learn over, over time and get better at. Um, but it is certainly something that some kids are, are just given that natural. It's, it's kind of the same thing as calling some kids are natural at different things, right? You know, they, yeah, like they grew up playing it. Mathematics in school Correct. or, you know, any other sport or, you know, a musical instrument. Yeah, um, which I was not natural at that. Yeah. I mean, there's some six-year-olds that can sit down at a piano and, and just play right away. Yep. But I think, I think where we get it wrong in the hockey world is we don't, you know, we see a kid that sits down at the piano and does has no idea what's going on, and we just say, well, you know, he doesn't have it. Yeah, yep. And so we're going to – and I think this is uh, – you know, I wrote it down on my sheet here. It's it's the the way to think about this is like a, a propensity to learn more quickly the game, right? So, like, no, no four- or five-year-old knows what offsides and icing is. I mean, they're taught that at some point. Yep. So what do you think are some of the factors that – contribute to a athlete quote unquote having it uh, or or learning more quickly i mean i see we got five six things to to topics here to go off of that but one thing that i'll maybe talk about first as i don't see it on here is just being around the game at an early age you hear the stories of of you know their kid was a rink rat or you know maybe is a son of a coach or uh, mom and dad had season tickets to the wild games or college games. And so meaning he's at the rink constantly at the age of two, three, four, five, and all of a sudden he picks up hockey and gets on the ice and he's able to do things more at the age of five and six than others can. And then as he gets older, he has that hockey sense that he learned by watching high school games, college games, NHL games, because he was around it more than maybe the average kid. So I think that's one thing that maybe isn't on here. Um, that I think is a is a contributing factor to hockey sense is just being around the game. Well, um, older siblings, right? I mean, old, that that would be that would be a huge one. That's an easy easy one. But for the parents that didn't play hockey, let's say, and they have their first kid that really loves the game, what are some ways to make up for that? Um, the outdoor rink, 
going out and playing uh, pond hockey with your buddies um, because that's a place that they can go and be creative with no structure. Okay. So there are no um, offsides per se or icings. There are no coaches coaching the game. They're just out there being able to do the fun behind the back plays or the saucer passes or whatever. Um, you know, playing knee hockey and floor ball or whatever, floor hockey in their basements or with their buddies yeah. and, um, you know, just doing things like that. Um, even throwing the Xbox on and playing hockey with your buddies and trying all those cool fancy plays that then you go to the rink and you, you're you trying those fancy plays and that's how you start to learn all that stuff. Yeah, I think uh, actually – well, and watching hockey, I don't think you mentioned either. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're new to the game as a parent and you have a kid that's that's new and he really loves it, just throw on hockey on the TV as much as you can. Or, you know, even if you don't have cable, just get YouTube going on clips and everything. Get them exposed to as much as possible at, at an early age. Correct, yeah. I mean, turn it on the, on the TV, watch the games, take them to the, the high school games. I mean, bring them to a YZ, a Dyna game here at Pick and just, you know, have them watch – you know, hockey, maybe tell them to focus on who some of the top players are, watch what they do. And, yeah. you know, then you go and those little kids who are six to 10 or whatever, they go to the rink and they're, they're trying the things that they just saw the high school kids do. And eventually they'll start learning more and more. I mean, you could almost argue that an hour or two spent at a high school game is more valuable for your development hockey sense wise than an hour of training on the ice. 110%. Yeah. I would, I would completely agree with that. And, it's also five bucks yeah. instead of whatever it costs. Unless they raised it to seven. <laughs> I think it's seven for, <laughs> for adults. Okay, so now it went to 12. <laughs> Don't forget the popcorn and the pop. And why is that? We're going to do, you know, we're doing Jersey nights and, yeah. and all that all that type of stuff. So, um, how okay. do you th- Go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah, I think watching hockey just in general, whether it's in person, on the TV, like you said, YouTube, Instagram, whatever all the stuff is out there, you can watch hockey at any at any given time. Yeah. So how do you think um, how do you think like puberty and um, a player's size can affect their development? Kind of more moving into that those later years, maybe moving into peewees. How does how does that avail- that development curve physically affect their mental curve? I mean, a lot of it can have to do with. Uh, in, I mean, I see we have stuff written down here. Early puberty. I mean, a lot of it can do with confidence. You know, if you hit puberty early, maybe in peewees, you see the kids that went through a growth spurt. Um, they might be able to pick up on the game quicker then because they're able to pick up on the speed, might have a little bit more confidence versus somebody that was a late puberty kid, maybe, you know, is growing through a little bit of a growth or a little bit kind of a learning curve in peewees and first year bantams. But as long as you understand the game, it's, you're, it's eventually going to get there. Right. And on the flip side, I mean, wouldn't you say that somebody that is big early – um, doesn't have to think the game. Correct. And so their mental piece of their development could actually suffer. Yeah, correct. Yeah, because so, they're able to get away with things because of their size. Yeah. Certainly. So then that goes back to the outdoor rink, too. I mean, no matter how big you are as a peewee, you can always find a game outdoors where you're the small kid. Yeah. Right? Yep. And playing with players that are three, four, five years older outside. Yep. And I think to to talk more about the outdoor rink stuff is – you see it so less common these days in the cities, but you see the northern teams far, you know, do it far more often. Yeah. And there's no – I mean, you think about the teams up in War Road. Uh, how would you describe their hockey sense up in War Road when they play? Are they a systematic team or are they kind of a go with the flow and um, be creative? And, you know, you see that so much in the north because a lot of those teams up there are doing stuff outdoors. The kids are having fun down here. You know, the outdoor rinks don't always have kids out on them. Sure. At least not as much as I did, you know, 15, sure. 20 years ago. And then I guess the last one we haven't touched on in this kind of area would be um, multi-sport athletes and how that affects your overall athletic athletic sense, um, connecting your body to your mind. Yeah, I think just multi-sport athletes in general are going to be beneficial for every kid. Um, you always hear the term kind of being an athlete, right? So. Um, those that are out there making, I mean, think of kids playing baseball. Again, it's to me, hockey sense has a lot to do with playing off the ball or off the puck. So think of a kid that, you know, is playing D-back or linebacker and how much they have to think at football versus the, the quarterback. He always has the ball, so he knows what he's doing 
typically. Yeah. Think of a kid that plays uh, baseball, you know, and, you know, playing in the infield or whatever. I mean, you, you have to think without the ball and um, think ahead what the next play is. And that's kind of, to me, is what part of hockey sense is, is thinking ahead and knowing, you know, what's going to happen maybe before it happens. So thinking without the ball or the puck. Yeah, and I think, like, if you only played hockey your whole life, you – there are certain situations where unless you were taught it specifically from a coach, you wouldn't know what to do. Yeah. And I think, like you said, if you're playing linebacker in football, you know how to angle somebody out of bounds, let's say, on a rush um, without being told it. Um, you know, maybe you're told by your football coaches, which is fine, but yep. you can translate that to hockey. Correct, right? correct. So that's kind of the whole idea. So, I mean, uh, that we've kind of covered, um, you know, what you can do to um, speed things up at a, at a younger age, but I kind of wanted to move into – what coaches can actually do in their seasons this year um, to provide an environment, in my eyes, where the, this growth um, on the hockey sense front can can um, accelerate. So what, what do you think is the number one thing that coaches can do tomorrow if they have an hour practice, whether it's shared or solo, um, to improve things? Uh, small area games, small area games and – <laughs> Small area games. Um, I don't think the average youth coach does enough small area games in their practice. I think any – I mean, I get that the younger kids and maybe the, the lower level peewees and bantams, you should certainly need to focus on skating and, and the skills. But I still think um, 30 minutes of, of small area games is far more beneficial than – doing a one-on-one -on -one drill or whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah. And I think coaches don't well, do call it enough. Them, I call them scripted, scripted drills. There you go. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So a small area game is obviously not scripted. Correct. Um, but if we're doing some sort of pattern on the ice where we're making two passes and then we're attacking two-on-one, -on -one, that is a scripted drill. Yeah. So. And I think the problem with the average youth coaches, I don't think they know enough small area games. And I think when you – talk about the concepts and, and systems within the game of hockey, which is what all youth, youth coaches love to talk about, right? You know, power plays, penalty kills, breakouts. I mean, you hear it at, at the lower levels all the time. I mean, there's ways you can do things within your small area games. I'm sure at YZ, you, you guys run small area games that might have to do with a power play type concept. Um, sure. You're able to run things, you know, of different small area games. I just don't think youth coaches know enough of them. So the more that they can – watch ask questions you know i think a lot of them just do the same ones but there's i mean i'm sure if i asked you you could come up with 30 to 50 small area games really quickly yeah and i think i i think part of it is when you're running a small area game as a youth coach you sort of feel like you're not doing anything to help the kids and so I, what i see a lot is that it's it's thrown in at the end of practice for 10 or 15 minutes as play or fun time Yep. And then the coaches take a breath and they step back and they're like, okay, practice is over. Let's have some fun. Yep. But what I'd like to start seeing is, is actual teaching of the game within these small area games. So if we can design a game that works on um, power play concepts, Yep. right? So the, you know, everyone, you know, the most popular one I can think of is the four on two on each side of one zone with yep. two nets on the goal line. Um, and then the two penalty killers have to get the puck to the other side to their team. Yep. Um, obviously working on power play concepts in that drill, but there are specific moments when you're watching the drill that you can stop it and talk through something. Correct. Similar to what you would do if you're working on a five on four power play unit type formal practice. Yep. So yep. I, yeah, I think I mean I think you said it right with the coaches don't feel like maybe they're doing any coaching and I think at the same time sometimes parents in the stands don't understand that they think oh it was just you know what'd you do today we just played games all day and they think it was maybe a wasted practice they don't understand the benefit that that probably had on the kid versus your scripted drills. Yeah. And then yeah just being able to stop things and break things down or coach the kids shift by shift as they come back to the line or whatever are things that are far more yeah, so like touching on that, like what are some what are some things that you could think of for a coach to identify 
improvement in hockey sense with their players so that they can then turn to the parents and say, we did games all day today, but here's our, here's point A, B, and C that we worked on as far as it relates to the game of hockey. And then how do they actually verify that those things are improving in their players? I mean, I think part of small area games, a lot of it, you know, you can talk about, you know, coaches always like to ask questions about D zone or what do I do? Well, small area games can really be a D zone drill because a lot of it can kind of be man on man, right? You're responsible for this kid or whatever. So you can work on it and say that that's something that we probably improved on that day by teaching kids to how to play off the puck, you know, teaching them that, hey, that's your guy. Wherever he goes, you need to stay a stick length from him. Yeah. And then see how maybe there's some improvement that had gone on that week or two weeks in, in your games. Same thing like you said with the power play. You can work on, you know, a three on two or a four on two on each half of the ice. And now you're working on the kill of trying to get the puck to the other half. You're working on good stick position. You're working on separation, you know, for power play stuff. Maybe it's some one-timer, things like that. And then you could look at how did that work, you know, over the next two weeks in your practice and did it get any better or continue to go back to it and, you know, things like that. Yeah, and I think another thing that you could you could try to do is let's say you are working on D-zone coverage and you design a you design a three-on-three down low, which is, you know, one half of D-zone coverage. Um Put some goals out there for your players yep. as far as only we're only allowed to give up three or four shots on net. Yep. Um, oh, and teach you your know. defenseman to skate it out of the zone if you want yeah. instead of throwing the puck down. I mean, you see a lot of it where it's three on two or three on three and, you know, have the defensive team skate the puck out or, you yeah. know. And make it a competition, right? Yeah. I mean, the, if they skate the puck out, they get two they points. Get, exactly. Um, if they give up a shot, it's a point against. So right, there's a couple more things I want to touch on. I think we have about five or ten minutes left. Um, one thing is in-game, in-game behaviors for coaches um, on the bench. Um, how do you, you know, you've been around the hockey, youth hockey world for a long time. Uh, what do you see the biggest negative out there in, in youth hockey games? Um, I mean, there's probably a few, but uh, as let's, far as related yeah, related yeah, to this hockey yeah. sense, let's you know. go with uh, coaches uh, probably being more concerned about their record and not the kids learning the game on their own, and thus you hear uh, the concept of of controlling their team like they're holding a joystick and and kind of controlling the the game themselves and yelling from the bench what to do every single play. And you hear it constantly or see it constantly, and I think that takes the freedom and creativity away from the players. It also, <clears throat> excuse me, it also um, doesn't let them fail, which kids need to fail because yeah. that's how you learn and get better. So if you're constantly telling them what to do from the bench, they're not going to be able to learn on their own, and I think that certainly goes into the hockey sense because you're not letting them learn each play on their own because the game of hockey, not, not any – I mean, it's the same with every sport, right? Not – any play is the same as it was five minutes ago. Yeah. So the kids have to constantly learn. And, you know, if, if you have a, a defenseman that's going to slam down on the wall and you're yelling chip, chip, chip from the bench, I mean, that's great. But the kids eventually have to learn that on their own and do that without a coach yelling to them from the bench to do it. They, they need to know that. Yeah, what happens if your controller dies on, on your joystick? Correct. <laughs> I don't think you can just run a target and get new batteries real quick. I think then you? all the kids on the ice would just be standing still. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's you, you see it every every place you go and you, you see coaches and it's just that overly competitive coach maybe that wants to win those games. And, yeah, you, you might be a better team when you're doing it because you're telling the kids what to do, but I, I, I think you're taking the, the freedom and the learning part out of the game that the kids need to do on okay. their own, and thus that's hockey sense. They need to learn that on their own and know what to do. Um, without you telling them. Perfect. What are some things that that you would think would be positive to tell kids during a game, either on the bench or on the ice? Is there any situation where you'd be talking to a player on the ice? I mean, on the ice, uh, when a player's on the ice, when it comes back to the bench, I mean, certainly one thing I would say on the bench is what did you see? You know, um, if it's a line rush or if it's something in the D zone or the neutral ice, you could just ask them, what did you see? And then, you know, let them explain it to them or explain it to you. And then, you know, maybe talk to them through things, draw something up for them, and then let that continue to happen. And again, what did you see rather than yelling it to them from the bench? Um, if you're talking about yelling anything to the 
team from the ice or during the game, I mean, any sort of face-off play you want to run or something like that maybe. But I'm a pretty – I, I try not to yell too much. I, I kind of yeah. have the make three, you know, let the kid fail three times before you really coach him. Yeah. Um, let him learn the game on his own. Yeah. All right. So sort of wrapping up here, I, I wanted to get your – wanted to kind of revisit the the overall question of how to teach hockey sense because I think we've – you know, I don't want people leaving this podcast and just – thinking that we just said you know play small area games yeah. or you know don't yell on them during a game on what to do so what is it for you what, what are some more things that that we can be thinking about I mean I kind of we touch base on a lot of them but I think parents need to know that you know the kids are learning at all times whether they're at practice or not so when you're at practice the small area game should be a big portion of things but when you're not at practice you know taking them to a game turning the wild game on when you have friends over, um, you know, encouraging your kid to watch YouTube video clips of hockey plays or Instagram or following hockey players um, on their social media. So they're constantly seeing things that uh, the, the NHL players or college players are doing, um, you know, letting your kid, you know, play when he's playing knee hockey or at a whatever, letting him have fun with his buddies that way. Um, you know, if he has that Xbox, which a lot of kids do, you know, letting him play hockey. You know, and, and policing how much you're going to let them play the Xbox. But I, I, I mean, jokingly, this is a little off topic, maybe, but I remember uh, Squirt's parents would always say, How do you teach offsides? And I'd always say, Just let them play Xbox and turn offsides on. <laughs> They'll know really quickly when they went offsides on their Xbox game. <laughs> but, you know, just letting them be a multi sport athlete, um, trying to let them think without the ball or without the puck. And I mean, it's, it's one thing to have hockey sense when you have the puck, but it's also another thing to have, have hockey sense when you don't. So, Playing multi sports um, is going to help them out in that as well. And last question: Do you think? How do you think we are doing overall? Like, are coaches getting this, or is there a lot of work to be done? I think there's a lot of work to be done because I don't think coaches play enough small area games, and I think coaches try to do too many scripted drills. Um, I think breakouts is your most common thing you hear at the squirt and peewee ages as my kids my team doesn't know how to break out and right you and, all, t- and i've said this for years all of, all a breakout is is keep away correct two passes it's keep away uh moving one zone forward yeah yep right so any keep away game will help with breakout work uh, and, and again off topic but how many times do you dump a puck in in a high school game and you easily just go d to d to the wing and you skate the puck out so in a practice that's what you see is D to D to the strong side wing, yeah. but that rarely happens in a game. So it's, again, just the small area games stuff, and then when they play the smaller games, finding that t- right time to coach them, but also letting them have freedom in the game too, letting them do things that, you know, maybe that's not the most conventional way that you would have done it, but that's how they're going to learn things. And they might – somebody might do something in a practice, and you might say, where did you see that? And they might tell you, Alex Ovechkin, you know, how many squirts do you see taking one-timers – and then you hear coaches yelling at him because he took a one-timer. Well, that kid probably just watched the Washington Capitals play, and now he wants practice taking a one-timer. Yeah. Um, and then one more thing that I wanted to make sure got in here was when we're talking about these small area games in practice, make it the focus and the star of your practice, right? Like when kid, when you, when a player goes home and, and their mom asks what they did, we did this small area game. It was super fun, and we worked on this. And And we did it for like 15 minutes. And one of the best ways to do that, I think, is a lot of the practices that I'll run, you start off with a small area game. Yeah. I mean, how many practices do you start with a small area game? Probably quite a bit. So when the kid goes to hockey, he knows he's going to get 10 minutes of small area game to start. Then maybe you go into something else, then you end the last 15 minutes with a small area game. So the first half or the first 15, 10, the last 10, 15, means the kid's excited to come to hockey the next day and he probably left with a little bit of a smile. And again, build that competition in there. You know, I always made it where you played for something. You know, loser had to pick up pucks or loser had to go down and back or whatever. So it adds that competitive drive to the kids too. So it's not just like parents would say, oh, they just had fun. That's it. They didn't learn anything. Yeah. I remember there was a couple of years ago when I was coaching Pee Wee at Wazetta and we started off with three on three cross ice. And we were sharing with a, I think we were sharing with like a B2 team. So we didn't do anything together just because the skills discrepancy was so big. And uh, the other coach came, I was standing on the red line, he came over and he goes, what are you doing? And I said, 
playing cross ice. <laughs> and he goes, he goes, that's awesome. I love that. <laughs> and so, so again, know that it's right. Don't be worried about parents. Um, don't be worried about um, getting so many skill development reps in um, where they have to be able to hold their outside edge on week one. Um, don't get stressed out about that. If you if you find a game that you really want to do, have confidence and do it and and enjoy teaching the game through that way because I think I find that's more fun anyways for for coaches. Correct, and it's a lot easier to plan your practices that way too. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think the more smaller games you add. Um, the better you're going to be, and you can even have a small area game week and um, pick teams and have them play two days in a row or three days in a row and play for Powerades and pizza or something. You know, have fun. The biggest thing is have fun with it and do different things. But I'll add, Miles, before we're done here, is it, you know, coaches that don't know it or don't know that they just got to ask because some coaches might not know enough small area games. I think sometimes coaches are afraid to ask questions. Like I said, I bet you could give you know 20 small area games to a coach within a matter of 30 minutes. Yes. And that coach might not have known of 15 of them. So, yes. Um, the, the last thing I'll add is I don't know if this is going to be released before our coaches meeting, but that is the subject of my presentation on ice is we are going to go through um, a lot of different games that you can use to teach different concept and even systems in the game of hockey. So um, with that, if you have any questions, reach out to me, hockeyops at wisetahockey.org. Um, stop me at the rink whatever the case may be. But Ben, thank you for coming on today. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Miles. I'll find out if I'm uh, invited back based off how I did, I guess. So. <laughs> All right.